Well, good morning, everybody. My name, my name is Neil Smith, and um, Brother uh, Carver was right. Uh, about 30 years ago, we, we met him. Linda and I were at a camp in 1988, January of 1988, up at Coolum. And so that's, that's many years ago now. Linda and I have been married 29 years. Uh, that was last weekend, so we're coming up to 30. So when we were at, at uh, I think it was about our 22nd, she said to me, I, I just can't believe we've been married for 22 years. And I said, I thought it was 25 years. And 25, I said, darling, we just fit a lot into that time. You know, just, so, but, but, I, but I'd remembered. First Kings, if you would please, this morning, First Kings in chapter 8. I was brought up in a Christian home. Um, the family and I, we, the, uh, we, we all went to the Salvation Army, brought up Salvation Army. And... Um, when I, uh, when I was in my early teens, I knew I needed a saviour and I trusted the Lord to save me. I, I asked him to save me. Uh, I, I knew there was that, there's that thing in my heart, you haven't done this, you're not a Christian. People think you are, but you're not. And God had dealt with me and worked in my heart. And uh, one night, the house is gone now, I called by there down in Ipswich. The house is now gone, there's my grandmother's house, the front bedroom. And I asked the Lord to save me. I, was, I, I didn't mark the date down. I was about 13 years old and I wanted to have it settled in my heart. And God gave me a peace, a peace that passes all understanding. I, I never, I never, it, it never bothered me again whether I was saved or not. Down through the years, it did bother me how I was living, if I was living for God, if I was doing what I wanted to do. But the, the, the thought of being saved or not, that never bothered me at all because it was settled in my heart. And when God, when God births you into his family, when you become a Christian, there's a peace in your heart that it, the world cannot take away. And that, that peace that peace is not just for, for salvation. As you go through times of trial and testing, times of, of loss and sorrow, of grief, or times of ecstasy, times of depression, all ranges that peace can be there. I can't explain it, but I know when I've got it and I know when I don't have it. And when I don't have it, I go looking, Lord, why? What's come between us? Because God will give you the peace that you need as you go through all sorts of situations as you face life. We need that. This life is too rough for any of us. It really is. We, we don't have enough. We haven't got enough. We all, all, the only way we can get through in life is by what God does within us as he works in us. There, there, there's, there's no other way that we could ever get through life otherwise. First Kings chapter eight. These things have been. This passage has been on my mind the last couple of weeks. Um, I've just read through this, and this morning I was, I was out on my walk, and I was um, I, I, I try to walk each morning, and I was over in Second Chronicles chapter five. That's the parallel passage to here in First Kings eight, and I was listening to it as I was on my walk. And these things have been going on over in my mind. We're going to uh, start in verse 51 and, uh, of chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 51. And we're going to look through these opening verses of chapter 8 down, down through verse 11. So, so was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated... Even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. So David, David had a desire to build God's house. And God says, no, David, you're not going to build it, but your son Solomon is. Well, David thought, well, if I can't build it, I'm, I'm going to get all this stuff together. So David started bringing stuff together and collecting it ready for, for David, uh, ready for Solomon to build the house. So in, cha in these chapters coming up to this, they, they had built the temple. David's passed on. They'd built the temple. Here's Solomon now. The work was ended. Okay, let's bring everything in. And they bring it all in. Chapter 8 now, verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that he might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves under King Solomon at the feast uh, in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. 
And all the elders of Israel came and, and the priests took up the ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the, temple, uh, and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord into his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, and the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and there they are under this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put, in, put there at Horeb when the Lord made a, covenant in the, made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So they had everything ready in verse 51 of chapter 7. Everything was, everything, the work was finished. Then they said, let's bring it all in. And they bring it all in. And then we see the end result of all that, that the glory of the Lord filled the house. God met with them. God met with these people as, as they did that. Everything was in place. They brought the silver in, the vessels, everything was there. And God came along and God, and God met with them. So to us today, we come along to church and we've got the pulpit, we, we've got the chairs, we've got the platform, we've got music, we've got people, we've got singing. But it's God meeting with us. Church ought to be a place where we meet with the Lord and the Lord meets with us. Some, so often it, it, it's hard to get God to turn up at church because people are doing what they want to do. And yet, and yet we read here, David, previously David got the pattern. He found out what God wanted. They get it all set up. Solomon did after the pattern that David got. They put it together and they built it and the Lord turned up. But one thing was missing. Everything was in place, but one thing was missing. Where's God at? Where's God at? There's... When we meet here at church, is, does God meet with us? Or is this our service? Uh, where's God at in your life? Where's God at in your home? Because God wants to meet with you. My dad died, he was 56, one and only heart attack. But dad did tell me, he said, God wants to meet with you. God wants to be a part of your life, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. See, see God's, God's not waiting at church saying, oh, I'm here, I'm here. No, no, God's still with, God, God is available when you go, your, go to your home. You get up Monday morning, you're facing Monday-itis, you don't want to go to work, and God's meeting with you. I'm, I'm here. I want to be with you. Here in the, here in the, the passage we're looking at is specifically about the church. And, and, and you ever been to somebody's house when they're not at home? Are you comfortable when they're not at home? Well, I, I'd go to... But friends of ours, they live on a farm out Boone away there. And they always said, Neil, if we're not at home, we're not going to be far. Just let yourself in. All the doors are always unlocked. Just, just let yourself in. You can make yourself a cuppa. And uh, just come on in and uh, we'll, we won't be far. But it's just not the same when that family wasn't there. And so too, when, when I go down to God's house, I'm, I'm looking, if it's God's house, I'm looking for God to be in his house because I'm needing something. I don't know what sort of week you've had, but you look back on your past week and you think, wow, what a week. Maybe you've had a good week, but you're standing on Sunday and you're looking down next week and you think, oh, look, what, look at this week coming up. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Man, I need God. 
I need something. I, 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 I don't have it. I need something more. And God, God is the difference. You ever seen a really nice car? Just look at it, the paint, wow, look at, oh, look at that. You just can't wait for it to start to hear it. Going to church, you've got all the outward, but there's no motor, there's, there's nothing in it when God's not there. Folk, make God a priority in your own life and in your home and in the church. Make God the priority. People will, will, will quickly say, oh, but we're two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Read the context of it. It talks about being clean. It, th- th- there's a process there to make sure if we want God to turn up. We just can't take it for granted because we meet that God's going to turn up. We can't take it for granted. Beseech him, ask him, seek him out, plead with him. God, please come and meet with us. When I go to church, I don't want a religious experience. I, I don't want to have a religious meeting. I, I, I want God to turn up. I want him to speak to my heart. I, I, I want to get something out of the book. I want to get something from the song service. I want to get something when somebody prays. In, in, instead, of, instead of just going through the motions, God, I want something that's real. A song we used to sing when I was in Sunday school, I want to be more than a Sunday go to meeting Christian. I want religion that thrills me every day. Saying good morning to the preacher is fine if all week long I live my life right. I want to be more than a Sunday go to morning meeting Christian. And I want, I, I want more. I've got to live in God. I've got to live in Christ. I want to live in Christianity. I don't want to just go through the motions. And here's and his, his, and his, his temple. It's been dedicated. Verses 1 and 2, I see there that an assembly was demanded. Solomon assembled all the elders. It started with the elders. He brings them all together. Notice those, there's the heads of the tribes. There's a the chief of the fathers. And men, we are responsible. Men, it's, it's our responsibility in the church. It's our responsibility in the home to lead it in such a way that the women and children behind us will have an eye on the men and we have men walking with God. Some families don't have a man in the home. Those ladies can still be looking at the pastor and thinking, the pastor is walking with God. I've got a godly man in my life that I can point my children towards and say, children, you can look at that man. Children, look at him, follow him. He's a good example. He's the one to lead us. But men, it's our responsibility to do that. We have, a, we have a, a leader there, Solomon. Solomon knew God. Solomon spent time with God. Solomon, God says, Solomon, what do you want? Solomon says, oh, Lord, I want understanding. I want wisdom and understanding to come in and out before your people. And God says, well, Solomon, you didn't ask for money and you didn't, you didn't ask for victories. Solomon, you didn't ask for long life. But Solomon, I'm going to give you all those because you had the right heart attitude. Solomon was a leader. And how our churches need leaders that walk with God, that, that, that know God. And just have a humble walk and say, God, I'm listening. God, I'm listening. Tozer, Tozer wrote many years ago. Linda, my wife, was reading it and she cut it out. And, she, and it says, uh, and he said, if, if the church is to recover from the injuries that she suffered in the first half of the century, that was last century, she said, he said, if, we, if, we, if the church is to recover in the second half from the da- damages of the first half, we need men that will walk with God. And men, we need to be walking with God because there are people that, that are watching us. They're seeing how we live. God can make a difference in a life. God can make a difference in a home. God can make a difference in the church house. God is a difference. It's not religion. Try, try any religion. It's all the same. Even Christianity, take God out of it and, and just live your own style and your own method of Christianity. Take him out. But I'll tell you, it makes all the difference in the world when God turns up and you've got a relationship with God and God is real and the book is real and, and you just can't wait to meet with him. Not just on a Sunday. I look forward to my quiet time of a morning. Just I quiet myself down, have a cup of coffee and I just get back, I get back into the word. I start with the word. 
I want, I'm looking for God even of a morning. We're needing the glory of God to meet with us, Amen. to turn up, to make a difference in a church, to make a difference in our lives. We ought to assemble. And when we go to church, it ought to be because we want to. Not that we're made to, but we want to. Oh, I better go. The preacher's going to call me. No, no, no. I want to go. I, I want to hear. I want to listen. I want to sing. I want to be there. I want to take part. I, 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 want, to, I want to go there. Uh, not, it says over in Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Man, come together. Look forward to assembling, coming together to pray and to hear from the word of God, to have God meet with you, to minister to you that very thing that you need. God isn't far off. God's close. God can draw nigh and, and minister. You think, I never thought I'd get that today. And God will minister to you. But it's about being in church. Verses 3 and 4 talks about the ark. Uh, you also see that the ark is also mentioned in verse, in verse 6, verse 7. It's also mentioned in verse 9. The ark is a picture of the presence of God. The ark pictures the presence of God and they brought the ark in and set it in his place. We need to be careful how we handle the presence of God. God can be grieved. He can be quenched. God can be pleased. God has emotions just like we do. But we need to be careful what we do with the presence of God, with his ark. In David, David uh, brought up the ark in, in 1 Chronicles 13. He brought up the ark and it said they were, they were playing music. They were dancing with all their might. They, they put the ark on a new, on a new card. And he said, oh, the, what, what? they went to expense. They went to effort. They, they, they put it all in there. But then it came to the threshing floor of Uzzah and, and it moved and Uzzah put forth his hand, no, the, thre th the threshing floor of Nashon, and then Uzzah put forth his hand to stop it. And God smote him. Chapter 14, David left. David says, man, I'm not going to mess with that. Chapter 14 goes by. Chapter 15, they bring the ark up again. But David said, we did not seek him after the due order. Just because we've got a heart for it and we've got time for it, we've got effort for it, we've got money for it, it doesn't mean to say we can do it however we want. If we're going to seek after God, there is a due order. We just can't turn up and, oh, this will do. Find out what God wants and how God wants it done. And then God will come and meet. Instead of, trying to, instead of trying to do it all ourselves. We find it was the priest that handled it. David and David, when David first tried to bring it up, David just done it all himself. New car, new way of doing it. God says, no, the priests must handle it. Each of us, if you're saved, you're a New Testament priest. We get to handle the, the presence of God ourselves in our daily lives all the time in how we live and in what we do, we get to handle the presence of God. There was a place made for it and they brought it into his place. I, I thought of 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, sanctify the Lord God on your heart. In other words, there ought to be a place in your heart where God is, that God is out of touch. You do not touch him. You don't bring him in disrepute. You don't question him. You, you, you don't make light of him. But God is above all reproach and all, and all disrepute and everything. There ought to be a place in our hearts where no one messes with God. Because that's God's place in me. We ought to be very jealous when we come to church that no one offends God by the way they act or what they do that's going to cause God to run off and leave us alone. 
The most miserable Christian in the world is the one where God has stopped dealing with him. We don't want to, we don't want to offend the Lord and have him turn away and leave. We want, the, we, we want the Lord to meet with us. And we want the Lord to stay. And we want the Lord to minister. We better find out how God wants things done. There's a place for him. It, priests handled him. He was protected by the cherubim. Those cherubim would, would, would overshadow that mercy seat. Speaking of holiness, he's a holy God. And we ought to live in such a way that we think God is holy. I need to behave. I need to know how to act. I need to know these things. As I come to the house of God, as I do that. Verse 5, we see, we see there's some, some action taken. Uh, the, the, king of, the king and King Solomon, all the congregation that were assembled with him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. They took, they, they took action. They took part. Do you know church isn't a place for spectators? Yeah, yeah, church is a place for participators, not spectators. You, you watch things. I want to get involved. If, if I'm getting into it, I want to get involved. What can I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see a, a sporting event. You think, man, man, I want to have a go at that. Can I have a go at that? Can I do that? I, I want to have a go. You know, we come to church. It ought to be a place where we participate, not spectate. They took part. They brought in oxen and sheep. They brought in and, and they made sacrifices. They demonstrated their heart by participating. And church is a place for participation because others here need you to minister to them. We have to get over our welfare society in Australia where, where the government is going to give us this handout and going to do this for us and do this. Oh, it's all right, the preacher will do that and the preacher will do that, the preacher will do that. No, let's get involved, let's do it ourselves, let's be a part of this. Hey, this is my church, this is my God, my place, I want to get involved. And I minister. But, but, but I, I really haven't had any training. I reckon there's something you could do to be a help and a blessing to somebody else. Somebody, sometimes it's just a smile on the face and you greet people. What, a, what an encouragement that would be to visitors come along and think, oh, that, I, I remember you. You're, I met you last time I was here and blah, blah, blah. About ministering, they did that. Over in the parallel passage in uh, in Second Chronicles, we won't turn there, but tells us that, that, that they were arrayed in white linen. They dressed appropriately for coming to church. They, they they made sure they they were set the way they ought to be. We ought to it ought to be church ought to be a place where we get prepared to go. And sometimes I've turned up at church and I've just I've just been filthy. I've come straight from work but I wanted to get to church. I didn't, I didn't want to miss out what was going on. I'd just sneak in the back, I'd sit down the back and I'd listen. I'd get there late, filthy, dirty, overalls, I'm a, I'm a tradie, I'm a boiler maker. Sometimes you come in from erecting steel and the like, you're filthy, dirty. But I couldn't wait to get to church. I, 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 I wanted to be there. If nothing else... But, but Brother Neil, what if I get there and, and, and I fall asleep down the back? I reckon the preacher would just be as happy as to see you put in the effort to get there after working and you walk in a bit late, but you come in, smile on the face, pleasant disposition, and you fall asleep. He'd still be glad to see you because the preacher counts all the sheep. He looks at them, not because he's a numbers man, but because he has a heart for the sheep. I wonder brother so-and-so is. I hope he hasn't been hurt in an accident. I hope he hasn't been caught up somewhere. I hope everything's all right with his family. I know he's having trouble with his, with his kids, or with his wife. I know there's sickness in the home. I, I, I pray he's all right. And the, and the preacher's looking. God is more important than anything else in this world. And we ought to get, and it ought to be a case, man, I can't wait to get to church. I want to do that. There's music there, talks about music over there in Second Chronicles. 
It talked about the instruments that they used and the like, and it, about praising God, and God is pleased with our praises. It pleases him. It says he inhabits the praise of his people. Where if we would just give the Lord some praise and glory and, 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 just, and just set him up on high as God is the one, there's nobody else. We got, we got a great God. Don't sell him short. He's worth our praise. He's worth our honour. He's worth our glory that we, that we put him up on high and to do that. Like I said, my dad dropped out of a heart attack. He was, he was 56, one and only. I started getting great victory in my life when I thank God for it. Because it says, it's a, it talks about giving thanks in everything. I was 21. I just turned 21. Brother was 18, turning 19. Dad dies. I started getting a lot of victory when I, say, when I got to the point of saying, God, I thank you for taking my father. Because then I got my eyes off my father. I got my eyes on my heavenly father. And God takes me through a series of events and, and things where it just kept breaking me and got me to a point where I just kept looking at the Lord. But I'm telling you, I got some victory when I could just thank God for taking my father and it's just my mum, my brother and I. And, we all, and we've all got together and we thought, well, God must have had something special in mind to take your father, in, to take our father, uh, my mum's husband, in such a dramatic way. He went, to the, he went to the doctor the day before. They said, Ed, everything's all right. Course of medication, we'll have you fixed right up. He went for, he went for uh, blood tests that, that morning, Saturday morning. I went off to work, came home, he was finished. Yep, yep. Course of medication, you'll be all right. We can manage your, your condition. He didn't see out 24 hours after get, receiving that. How did you get through that, Brother Neil? I said, God is the difference. God makes a difference. And when we just slow down and stay close, instead of running off and trying to figure it all out, no, we, we, we slow down, we stay close, we keep, oh, Lord, what do I need to see? Lord, what is it? And Lord will make the difference in our lives. It talks about over there in Second Chronicles, it said that they, that they were as one. You know what's a killer for us Baptists? Unity. All pulling together in the same direction. Unity. I know some Baptist preachers and they think unity is uniformity. Everybody dresses the same. Everybody looks the same. Everybody does everything the same. Ah, well, that's unity. No, that's uniformity. Unity is we're all together in heart and we're going in the same direction. Whether... We dress a little bit different than the other, whether we're a little bit taller or a bit shorter. Regardless, there is unity. Because God likes to turn up where there's no divisions, where there's unity, where, where, where he can do that. There's praising and thanking God. They had an anchored place of worship here in verse 8 of First, of first Kings 8. They had an anchored place. Why? They drew out the staves. That ark wasn't going to move again. That ark was going to stay there. It wasn't moving. You know, folks, God's got a place for you to be. A church, a place where he's going to meet with you. I want to go over to there because, oh, that church is so good. I like their music. I like their ministries. I like them. Is that where God wants you to be? Because you can go there and God will meet with everybody else, but you're still thinking... God, have I missed you? Because, God, I'm not getting what everyone else is getting. There is a place that he wants you to be. In Exodus 33, Moses says to him, he says, Lord, show me the way. And then a little bit, a few verses later in the chapter, he says, show me thy glory. And the Lord says, no one's seen my glory, but there is a place by me. And I'll pass by and you'll see. You know, folks, there's a place for you to be where God will reveal himself and show himself to you 
and you won't get it any other place because you are where God wants you to be. And once you find that place where you need to be, be there. Be there. Be all there. Minister and help and, and just be a blessing and just continue on for the glory of God. But getting the glory of God in the place, oh, I'm in the right place. Imagine having a whole church full of people, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Lord, I'm faithful. Lord, I'm participating. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I look forward to coming. God, I just don't want a, a Christianity that, that, that's for Sunday only. God, I want to take you to my workplace. And God, I want to have you in my home. And God, I want to have you wherever I go. I want to make sure, God, I don't leave you alone. I, I, I miss you. God, please come. And we have the glory of God in our heart. Too often we get by in, in the Christian life and we, it's almost like, oh, oh God, I've got it from here. No, we need God all the time. We need God all the time. Because there's a place for each of us to be that only we can fill. God's got something for you to do that only you can do it. He told Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, he says, Jeremiah, I've got, a, I've got something for you to do. I knew you. He told Jeremiah verses one and, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, he said, before you were born, I knew you. Jeremiah, I knew you. Jeremiah, I made you for a purpose. And Jeremiah submitted to that purpose, to God's call, to God's will. Jeremiah submitted to it. God made Jeremiah exactly what he needed to be to fulfill the purpose that God had for him. Come forward Two and a half thousand years, God has created, he has made each one of us for a specific purpose that only you can fill because he's made you for that. Oh, but someone else could do that. They could do it better than me. But God wants you to do it. And when you will do it, you and him build a relationship. He blesses you. He's got something in mind. He's got blessings untold if we will just do what he wants us to do and instead of trying to do our own ministry. This is the Lord's ministry. It's not our ministry. It's God's ministry. There is a place for us. But it says in verses 10 and 11, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. The approval and the abiding of God was displayed. God showed, God demonstrated that he was pleased with what happened in that place and the cloud came. His glory filled the place. The, the, the Levites, they got out of the way. Those ministers, they got out of the way. You know, when you find out what God's in, just get out of the way and let him do it and just ride along and enjoy it. Do your part, but Lord, what do you want? Lord, how do you want this done? And let God have his way. If God will have his way, you'll see the glory of God in your life, and you'll see the glory of God in your home, glory of God in the church. Having the glory of God. You've just bought a home. The handover takes place, you get the keys. But what happens when you go to that home that, that, that you've just bought and the people are still living in it? Is it your home or is it still their home? They won't let you have it. So too, we need to just get out of the way, give the keys to the Lord and let the Lord take care of it. Let the Lord do it. Years ago, I was up in Idaho preaching and there was a preacher, there, there, uh, and I was talking to the preacher and I said, I, I, I noticed your song leader, he's, he's just miserable. What's, what's wrong with him? He said, well, last year we had, a, we had a camp meeting, we had a special meeting, conference, and it came down to a point where God asked him for all the keys to all the rooms of his heart. 
and there was one key for one room of his heart that he wouldn't give over to the Lord. Well, I went back to that church a couple of years later and he was no longer there. He'd moved in a state, chasing better work, better conditions, but then he's out of church, his kids are out of church because he wouldn't give over that one key. And a real life illustration just played out there how that man would not give up that one key. He wanted to keep them all. He wanted to keep that one. Lord, here's these others. Lord, here's this one and this one. The preacher didn't, didn't say what key it was. I don't even know if that preacher knew what key it was. But it came down. There was an illustration given and he told the preacher, he says, oh, I've got one key I can't give. The preacher never told me. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It was just one key. Lord of all, we need him. Don't be, don't be afraid to give over all that you have, all the keys, all the parts of your life. Don't be afraid to give it all over. If we'd have a look at our own lives, we'd think, man, I've messed that up. Yep. Life is so much different when you give your life over and you let the Lord Jesus Christ rule and reign. To become a Christian, you turn away from your sin. You acknowledge you're a sinner. You repent. You turn away from your sin. You turn under God and you walk after him. Not only is he your saviour, but he becomes your Lord, where he will direct your life. And if we will turn and take him as our saviour and our Lord, you'll find life is a whole lot different. You've got, you got, retur- you, you got inheritance on the other side, you've got a peace in your heart now. So much happens. But for the glory of God, we need to find out what that is and that the glory of God will come in. You want to come to this place? This place ought to be a place of refuge. Get away from the bustle of the world, the problems, the difficulties we face, the the hurts, the disappointments, all that. We we just leave outside and say, God, I need you. God, I, I want you to minister to me. God, is there something here? And everyone's praying, God, I want your glory. Lord, not me, but thee your life in and through me. And he makes a difference. Every time I go to church, I I think of Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory. So So as I have seen thee, in the sanctuary. When I walk into a sanctuary, I'm looking, God, are you here? It certainly, ma- it certainly makes for a difficult church service when God doesn't meet. Don't keep him out. We, know, we ought to be doing everything we possibly can to have God come and meet with us. God is real and God wants to show himself real. If you want him, I'm telling you, it's worth the, it's worth the price that you pay to know God and to walk with him and have that reality in your heart that you know. Not just a head knowledge, yeah, yeah, God's real. No, you got you know it in your heart. Too often it, 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 it hits here, but it doesn't come to here. We, got, we, we, we do this too much. We try and think and analyse and, and go through it all. I'll do this and this and this. It, it, it does. We have, to pay, we have to count the cost. But, uh, but sometimes it's say, uh, well, I'm not going to bother with it unless I can understand it. Well, don't use electricity then because we don't understand it. 
There are many things in life we don't understand, but we still use them. Mobile phones are the craziest deal ever created. I don't know. I don't know. Anything. I just I push a button. I tell my kids I got calluses on one finger from texting them because that's I, I I can't do this. I, I can't. I don't understand it all. I, I I know how it works. I know what I've got to do to get a message to them. So too, I haven't got to understand everything about God and everything about salvation for me to become a Christian. I just know my need and I know where I can get it fixed. For the Christian life, I know what I need. I need God every day. Not just a religious experience, I need God every day and I know where I can find him. And it ought to be in the church house, the Lord's house. And this ought to be a place where God meets with his people and it makes a difference. Let's close some word of prayer. Father, this morning, how we need thee. Lord, how we need thee this morning. Father, we'll try and bumble through. Just so vain, so empty. Religion, Lord, uh, it leaves us with a hollow feeling. But Lord, when you're real, God, you make the difference. Father, would you please show yourself real here? The need that they have, each one. Lord, you can see the needs. Maybe there's somebody here that doesn't know you as their saviour. Would you speak to their heart, turn the light on that they might see? Lord, somebody here that needs a shepherd, Lord, would you guide them and help them? Somebody here, Father, needs a friend. Draw nigh to them. Lord God, may we see thee. Lord, we're a poor and needy people and we foolishly think we can try to take care of things ourselves. I pray that you'd minister and work. Help us, we ask. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.